Well, hi everyone. Welcome to the Should I Say or Should I Go event regarding the change of jobs and the willingness that people are uh, to change jobs right now during the summer. Uh, today we'll be having a, a small presentation regarding the perspective of landing jobs uh, about this topic. We'll also have some testimonials from uh, from some people that have changed jobs recently. And then we want to do a strong Q&A with all the audience, okay? So please intervene, ask your questions, leave your comments in the chat box. Uh, we have some polls open uh, right now. The first one, it's about where are you currently located? So please go there in the bottom of the screen. We'll be opening some more along the, this webinar. Uh, and let's build together a great event. So to, 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 to first make the first presentation, I think that the first person to make the presentation, it's Beatriz. Beatriz, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Yeah. Beatriz is one of the, the talent managers that we have in landing jobs. She's a great girl. She'll make uh, the first part of the presentation. So Beatriz, the stage is yours. Okay. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see the presentation? Yeah. Okay, let's kick this off. So, uh, should I stay or should I go? Why should you search for a new job in August? So, historically, or on a normal year, there are three specific times of the year that the recruitment reaches its peak, whether it being in applications or in job openings. And they are March, August, and October. Out of these three, March can be justified by the fact that it's around this time that there are some performance reviews on companies, um, recent graduates, and this helps increasing a lot of the search. And October is because usually people start to, um, to plan the, the new year and to look for other opportunities. August, however, it's quite surprising. It would be expected that the number of applications and jobs would decrease due to vacations and being the summertime. However, August presents a consistent increase in job applications. There was an increase of 29% of job applications in 2019 and a 48% increase in 2020. So this was quite surprising. A few reasons that could be behind these changes would be the fact that people make some um, summer resolutions during their vacations. They just finished their vacations. Now they uh, want to, to put their plans in actions. There are more positions open and this increases the number of applications. However, currently, um, not so sure if it's a positive thing, but we do need to consider um, in these last few years the COVID impact and what it's being called as the great resignation. So back in 2019, workers were quitting their jobs at record rates with labor experts saying that workers um, did so in order to secure pay, rage, pay raises and promotions that they weren't getting at the companies that they worked for. Uh, then 2020 came, COVID had a huge impact on a lot of markets, and it was a time where in uncertainty reigned. So um, a lot of people chose to stay at their jobs in order to, to, to be secure, to be safe. However, with signs that everything is improving, um, many um, economic sectors are recovering, so workers are now starting to feel again that itch to job hop. Um, some estimates point out that one in four workers were planning to, to look for other opportunities with a new employer once the threat of the pandemic subsided. Uh, a few reasons that could be behind this are the fact that, um, um, well, people are starting to have concerns regarding their career advancement, so they're looking to grow. And uh, the pandemic caused people to rethink their skill sets. So now they want to work on something different. And well, um, they want more flexibility, actually. People currently working remote say uh, that if they're, some people actually, uh, if their current company doesn't continue to offer the remote work options in the long term, that they'll look for a job in the company that does. 
we did a, a quick survey with a few of candidate, few candidates that we have in process with um, us, and it turns out that 39% were really focused on looking for new opportunities in terms of growth. Then around 50% of um, the people that we talked to actually were looking for more flexibility, so working remote, and they thought that the COVID actually had a great impact on this and opened a lot of people's minds. Um, we're going to look at um, a few um, testimonies from a few people that have recently changed jobs, and um, let's get right into it. Hi, Aligning Jobs. My name is Marco. I believe that we should always aim to educate ourselves to the best knowledge available. We should be in organizations and surrounded with people that share the same mindset. We should not be afraid of new now. So keep sharp, keep learning, and keep moving. Hi, my name is Denise, and I decided to accept the new challenge because being myself a polymath, I feel more alive while learning and while trying new things. And also because I do believe that good product design has the power to transform our lives. Hi, my name is Flavio Pereira, and I've recently decided to embrace a new challenge since I was looking to move out of consulting uh, to join a company with its own AI products. And since I was looking for a greater salary, of course, do not forget inflation. Okay, so I would like to invite Rui to join us to also give us this testimony. So welcome, Rui. Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, first of all, hi everybody. My name is is Rui. I'm a um, Mark Dev, and I will talk a bit about my experience moving between jobs. And um, I found maybe interesting to to give you two different perspectives on moving jobs. So, uh, I will talk about two moves I I made in my in my career, uh, and for different reasons. So to give you a bit of context, I'm um, I have a master's in computer science. Uh, I'm an engineer, uh, and uh, in the beginning of my career, I was uh, a lot more involved with um, with deep learning stuff and machine learning and algorithms and stuff like that. And as uh, cutting edge uh, at it may sound, I was working with lots of uh, academic projects in small companies. And my first move happened because of money, purely. I liked what I was doing, but let's be real. There is a time when you cannot go up in salary unless you move companies. I mean, you can stay for so long in a company and they can raise you. I mean, you can grow position-wise, but let's be real. Most of the companies, if you have... a a good uh, successful year, they they raise you like about five percent, ten percent, crazy, you know. And in the end, it's what fifty euros in your payroll at the end of of the month. I mean, that's not really interesting in that phase of your career. So, my first move was purely based on salary, and. Uh, my experience tells me and my colleagues, uh, my my f friends, my engineers, they always say, if you want to have a big raise in your salary, opting to a different company is the easiest way to do this. I mean, let's be real. It's awesome to work in some some companies and money is not everything at all. But if you want to get a boost on your paycheck, and please, guys, comment on your uh, on the on the chat, please, if uh, you guys agree with this or not. But if you want to have a, a paycheck like uh, a significant paycheck raise, moving is pretty much the only solution or the most obvious solution. Maybe not only; it's it will depend on the company. But most of the times, you will have to to jump between companies to have 
uh, improvements in in salary uh, sometimes in uh, in position as well Caio is agreeing with me so you you guys know this is the reality is is a bit sad isn't it so when you stay lots of time with a company and you like the company but moving sometimes is when you get the I mean the edge you know when you tend to negotiate lots of people on the chat agreeing with me yeah exactly uh, and for me it worked I mean I had a, a almost more than 30 percent raise when i jumped between between jobs which was great for me uh, i mean let's be real here uh, I, I was a young guy uh, fully uh, with lots of uh, of bills to pay and this was a real incentive it was great for me to have more money at the end of the of the day okay and so I moved to, to a big corp. So I, I left the, um, the things more academic stuff, more uh, uh, algorithmic stuff, and I went to a big corp. And I worked there for, for some years. And um, I, I will be real with you guys. I was not really enjoying the big corp stuff. Many of you guys do, and I totally respect people that do that. But uh, this brings me to the next move I made, or at least the next move I'm talking about. So I was working in a big consultancy company and working to a bank, a bank project, like a, a big project. But at the end of the day, I felt that I was a number. You know, I, I was a guy in a, in, a, in a sea full of people, like in a big, big company with hundreds of, uh, of developers, of, uh, of employees. And uh, in the end of the day, I felt that I was not making the difference. And I mean, I, I, was, I was earning well. Uh, I, I cannot complain about that. But challenge-wise, I was not put to the... I mean... I was not learning anything anymore, you know, because when you are in a big project in a in a bank or in you're not being inventive there, you know. You you you're going to follow the same thing all and all again. I mean, it was good in the beginning. I learned lots of stuff, lots of Microsoft uh, SSIS, uh, I developed a lot of uh, SQL skills and my C# -sharp was better than ever. But at the end of the day, I mean, I've done everything there. And if I if I made a mistake at my work, nobody would know. I mean, it, yes, it has so many stages before going to production. So, and the team's so big, whatever I do, I had no impact. So that's uh, when I come to my second change. And the second reason for people to change that I'm going to talk about is the challenge. So I, I decided uh, to go in a different way and I went to a startup. And in this startup, everything is chaotic, you know? So lots of stuff happening at the same time. You are a jack of all trades. In one day, you are programming in Rails. The other day, you're programming in React and you're doing some legacy code that is on a different, uh, uh, something that is deprecated already, but you you know what, you can erase it and write your stuff there and you have so much more freedom. If I make a wrong move in my work, oh guys, you, somebody will notice, you know? Like I, I have a call from production saying, man, Rui, you, you did some, some wrong stuff. Some stuff is popping to, to the users. You have to deal with this ASAP. It's, I mean, is an, ad uh, an adrenaline rush, you know, is so much more exciting coming to work. Everything is, everything happens. You do, you have your hands in a lot of stuff and you have like, you're not a number anymore. You have a responsibility. And the project for me, I mean, it compensates a lot of trouble changing companies because it's always troubling moving from company to company. And if anybody tells you is not, is lying. Because, I mean, you're comfortable in one place and you're going to another one and you don't really know, but it's worth it, you know? You learn so much. I, I, get, I got um, a pay raise as well. 
Uh, not that was what I was looking for on this move. I was in the before move on this one. I was not, but I got a, a pay raise and the challenge was incredible. The atmosphere at the company. And I mean, if you, if you feel that you are stuck in your project, you are not learning anything anymore, make a move. Don't be afraid. I mean, it, it's really exciting. You know, it's like new projects, a new product, a new company, new horizons. I mean, your CV will get so much richer. You you see, if a person has on his CV that in 10 years he, he, he was in one company, I guarantee you that when um, a recruiter sees you compared to another that in the that time span of 10 years, let's say, has been in, for instance, three or four companies, they will prefer that one because he has experience. He has lots of different uh, worlds. He, he can adapt. And for me, that was that was a big, big plus. And I'm so, so much happy. Uh, I'm so, so happy, sorry, that I made that choices uh, some years ago. Yeah. yeah is, is this uh, testimonial OK? Uh, and you guys, let me say just this. If you guys have any concrete question, please leave on ask a question. I will be more than happy to, to answer you guys, OK? Cool. Thanks, Rui. Thank you. D -d Don't go away. Okay, we'll have, I, I believe, some discussion, some questions to, to answer and some points to debate in the future. Okay, so now for the last part of the presentation, there are two slides. So we don't like slides, but it's easy to convey some messages here. We have Pedro Castro, it's our head of business. He's very much knowledgeable about the, the, the tech recruitment market and he's going to share some insight with us. And then we'll step on to, this, to the fight. You know, let's, let's be controversial and say what we think about things as they are happening right now. Kast, go ahead. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone. Hello, wherever you are watching us from. So uh, then there's the company side, right? I mean, we've had a lot of testimonies and a lot of insights shared by both Beatrice, Rui, and our uh, cameos. Um, and uh, there's also another side to this, right? Which is companies, recruiters, right? And at the end of the day, I, I, I know that recruiters get a lot of bad rap uh between ourselves they are also they, they they really they have problems back back home back back at their workplaces i mean they have a lot of pressure uh on them they have uh, hiring managers through all structures products companies depending on their work so uh of course that doesn't excuse everything but uh it's part of the reason uh why um why it's, there is a lot of things to be said about recruiters and the, the, the way that they, 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 they work. But at the end of the day, uh, we should also take into consideration that we're in August, right? And it's impossible to think of August without uh, thinking holidays, right? A good summer love, uh, those summer nights, we could put some grease playing now instead of uh, the clash. But uh, it's definitely a time of the year where you could think that company activity is not as high. And I'll tell you very honestly, I mean, just the other day we were sending an email campaign to a lot of our companies and we got a lot of rebounds, so to speak, some out of offices and people not there. But at the same time, the, do not uh, despair because for every person that is not uh, working, there are probably two or three or four ready to get your application. And this actually gets me to the second part, which is, as you probably know, businesses uh, organize their budgets, their operations, their goals uh, in years, sure, but also in semesters. Uh, it's very unlikely to have companies um, unlocking the full budget or the full goals straight in January or December or wherever they start. They usually uh, release part of the budget in January and then another part in July. And now one thing that you will see is that uh, recruiters and companies have a, have a lot of positions open and a lot of needs uh, to fill. Uh, and actually, at the moment, if everyone thinks that everyone is on holidays, this also opens an opportunity, right? I mean, uh, in a time where recruiters only have so many applications, 
yours can stand out and be, <laughs> recruitment is not fair nowadays okay and uh, more the challenges to be polemic and controversial recruitment is not fair and so it's not about who is the best candidate for the job it's about who is the candidate that is good enough for the job and lands at the right time maybe a recruiter will pass interview and hire people in a low peak season that they wouldn't in a high peak season and so and this happens really this happens we see this happening we evaluate all our applications so we are able to see how uh, the 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 likelihood of a low ranking application to be hired changes across time uh, and so this definitely opens opportunities for you as a candidate to stand out from the crowd to apply to companies and to eventually be hired because the goals are out there these companies have been since the 1st of July going through all of this but with hiring managers asking for hires 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 and hires and they don't have anyone to present and so the pressure is really eating up and that is why the second semester is also uh, usually more aggressive in terms of recruitment than the first one uh, because number one, you have the results that you didn't achieve in the first semester and the, those carry over, they are not forgotten. But number two, you also have new goals and uh, less time to accomplish them. And so applying in August is a great way to make sure that you either do a, quite a smooth process during uh, uh, before the most of people are in. It's like Bitcoin, right? It was... Uh, hard to come in in 2017 and nowadays well yes you can go in but the the, the timing has, uh, is gone some might say uh, but yeah so this is pretty much the, the company side I also see some questions here that maybe I'll be able to, to, to help answering but I'll probably wrap it up for now Okay, uh, Castro, just following on on you one of the things that I uh, and you know a lot about at least the European tech recruitment scene because that's where we learning jobs work work most uh, do you think that there there's this the, a lot of articles are coming out about the recruitment tsunami mm -hmm. uh, the great resignation a lot of great names for movies you know but do you think that that's really happening because i have the notion that there is this kind of domino effect that people have been around one year closed and not changing jobs generally speaking of mm -hmm. course uh, and again, we we have some numbers. For example, that people usually tech tech people change jobs from one uh, one year and a half to two point three years. So that's more or less mm -hmm. the period that people stay in one company. And having people being locked down and not changing jobs for due to the pandemic, of course, has created some kind of pressure on the on the tech talent side for them now to change jobs in a in a, as a, a big wave, you know. Because the thing is, when, when someone leaves a company, that company mm -hmm. needs to hire someone that needs to fire themselves from another company. So this kind of creates a compounded yes. domino effect that can trigger a boost in everything regarding job changes, right? I mean, definitely. We, what we definitely see, Peter, is uh, companies, they might not expect to hire, but then out of nowhere, uh, someone comes, approaches their senior DevOps engineer and voila, uh, then the whole team falls behind and now they have a big problem in their hands and they need to hire fast and so they, they are going to the market again. Uh, I don't see, or at least in the metrics of the market that uh, um, I, I check with maybe more uh, frequency than I would like to admit, uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't see, so to speak, such a big wave happening at the moment, but uh, it's only certain that as uh, countries, I mean, it's because it's very different. One thing is, even in Europe, we have two very different realities. We have countries we have already gone through this so-called fourth wave and are already totally uh, drifting into an open field. And we have countries who are a bit more still uh, well, doing yeah. this journey and keeping up. Uh, but what I would expect is as soon as it's possible for people to live like they have before, uh, and when I mention these, I'm talking about events, I'm talking about conferences, I'm talking about... And all these opportunities will definitely unlock 
some uh, curiosity by people because at the end of the day maybe one of two things happened over the last one year we either understood that we don't like our jobs <laughs> we were left at our homes just doing our jobs and we understood that this is not what we want to do or we have actually figured out how oh, amazing i love to do this and i love to do this at home cool mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so one of two things will happen if you don't like your job, then <laughs> odds are very soon you will find one because the company will be looking for you. Uh, number two, uh, you found that you work okay uh, at home. And so should you work at home for a company uh, paying you a local salary or should you work at home for a remote company who may be able to, to, to compete and to give you better work conditions? And yeah. so, of course, it's very likely that these two factors will play a role in uh, the, 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 the job boom or the market boom that is being announced. At the same time, we also have people announcing a crisis. So, I mean, it's always, it's always uh, certain that one of them will be wrong. Uh, but yes, we'll never remember who was right and who was wrong. Yeah, yeah. but one, one thing is certain, the, the search for tech talent has not diminished in any way. Not at all. A long time, it's only increasing, right? Exactly. One, one, one other question for you or for Beatrice, so you two work together, so you get along your shit. Um, is, do you think that with this situation that the, at least European countries, the countries, companies, they're more open to hiring people, not only working remotely, but from other places? from other continents, for example, because local talent, as far as I know, it's getting scarcer by the day. So it's not enough in any way to fill the needs of companies in the European continent. And I'm talking about European countries because it's it's the context that we are most most at it, that we know better, right? But do you think that there's a bigger openness? Because previously I know that, okay, yeah, we are remote companies, we allow we even hire people from other places, maybe, but one thing was the discourse, another thing was the practice. Right? Do you think that something has changed in the meantime? Uh, I think circumstances forced companies to, 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 to act on their discourse. But I'll also tell you this, there, is, there are quite a good amount of companies who haven't realized uh, the world they're living uh, at yet. So companies that are still, I don't know, I don't know if it's denial, if it's uh, uh, optimism, I don't know, but we definitely have quite some companies and some of them you wouldn't expect them to be as uh, um, fixed on a certain, um, on a certain approach. Uh, we have quite a lot of companies who still believe that no, this will pass as soon as the the, the the COVID goes away, whatever that means. I mean, uh, but as soon as COVID goes away, uh, we will be able to go back to to the old ways. But we definitely have more openness, and we have more companies open to remote uh, candidates. Even though, unfortunately, not as fast as I would like. What do you think, Beatrice? Is this something from the candidates you follow? Uh, do you see any changes in candidates uh, being able to engage in hiring processes or not really? Well, um, yes and, and both no. I think it's um, not as linear as I hoped it would be. I was actually expecting after the COVID to, to actually watch companies become like super on board with this full remote type of, of work. Um, Nevertheless, um, um, sometimes um, no. Sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's uh, companies are like, okay, we accept remote, but we're looking for candidates in a specific location, which to me is not fully remote. Um, so there's still a bit of this um, mentality of everybody needs to work at the same time, and that's not really remote. Uh, remote is giving some people some flexibility. I was actually expecting that this was going to happen post-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, I did um, I do see candidates actually becoming more more engaged. Also, because it's a need for companies because candidates now they're looking for remote, and it's that uh, law of offer and um, a little demand. Bit, yeah, offer and demand. So. If companies want better talent, they need to be able to put out and to to actually meet these candidates' requirements, which is we want to work remote, which is fair. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, I think, but I think we're still going to go through an evolution on, on that side. It's not, we yeah. cannot uh, shift mentalities from night yeah, to day. But, but for, for just to give an example and the, the, uh, the, the tech career survey that the, the link is above in the shed that we have, we make every year, at least for Portugal, there's a lot of movement from Portuguese tech talent working for other geographies. So again, and this also has, has to do with economics because the salaries in Portugal, they are yeah. cheaper than the salaries in the UK or in Sweden or in the USA. Mm -hmm. you know, so obviously there's always also an economic factor like who you were saying about the, the, the career changes amidst this. And more and more people are working, at least the experienced in the people that are in Portugal, the tech talent in Portugal, working for mostly um, USA. It's very curious that a lot of them are working for USA, which has at least plus five or minus five hours in terms of time zone. So, I think that this is kind of a movement that progressively yeah. it's installing itself. It, because the thing is, uh, in my opinion, that companies will, will not have an option to go and search talent wherever they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, and I think that both parts are beginning, beginning both talent and companies, to be more acquainted with, uh, with this. One, one other thing that I think it's very interesting regarding all this career change, and especially taking into account potential international moves, either remote working from some other country to another country or even relocating. It's the thing about uh, being a permanent employee and a contractor. This is one of the ones that I love most because I'm not, I'm, well, I'm currently chief marketing officer at Lending Jobs, but I'm a computer science engineer also. So <laughs> the apple does not fall far from the tree. Um, and one of the things, for example, that we have noticed in this last report is that usually the gross annual salary for a contractor here Again, it's just one thing, one, one measure. It's 50% higher than the salary of a permanent employee. So this is a big difference when you talk about career changes. It's not just changing sometimes from a company to another. Sometimes it's really changing the work type, the work relationship that exists. And from my conversations, and I think that we can also step in into this, into this, uh, into, into this topic, a lot of people that have colleagues, friends working, remotely as contractors for companies or for other countries always question so but how is it working as a contractor do, do is, is it not risky for example is it, is it worth it the difference in terms of salary that you need to for example each year to look for a new project Hui, what do you think about this uh yes uh, i mean to, and this answers a bit the, there's a, a question here uh, that we sent he sends, yeah, he talks about job security. And uh, here, um, he, job security is a big issue when we talk about contracting because people are, are afraid, right? When, when you are working for a company, usually you have like a contract or something like that and you are somehow protected. In a, in a, um, in a contractor kind of way, you have uh, an, ass an assignment. So these you have for uh, three or four months or whatever. And then what next? Well, uh, in this case, you have to see that <coughs> you manage your projects in a different way. You see? So you're assigned to this company for an X amount of time. And then they can renew the projects. Most of the time, that's what happens, you know? And... Uh, in 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 uh, practically it's the same as being as a regular uh, employee uh, the main difference is is the the money you get because usually it's much more well paid the contracting positions you know uh, it's it's a trend that is is spreading right now i would say and this covid wave uh, with the uh, uh, companies being forced to employ remote uh, came to facilitate this because now it, it doesn't really matter if uh, uh, let's say there is a, a company in uh, in Berlin and if uh, all the employees are remote it doesn't really matter if the the employer working from them is at Berlin or it's in Switzerland or in Morocco or whatever I mean, they are all working remotely. So it, this opens a lot of opportunities for contracting. And contracting, you, you don't have to commit to one company. So you there, you work for um, how many months, and then you go to an, another project. And 
I mean, um, security-wise, in terms of job, let's be real, it's not the same as working in a company, of course, but it pays you better. So, I mean, it's a balance you have to make. It's, it's also a, a choice on your lifestyle. It really depends on your lifestyle, I would say because it's riskier, but it's high reward, you know? So it really depends on what you're doing. My, my friends that work um, in this kind of uh, contracts, so contractors, they really like it. So they, because they make so much money and they kind of decide the, the vacations they have in between projects. So they say, okay, I will work three months for this company in this task. Then I will work six months on that one and they'll manage. And I, I will say that uh, uh, my, my friend that works in this kind of um, contract the most, he, <coughs> the time he spent without working the most was like two months and uh, he went to do um, a south uh, south uh, asia trip you know so because when you when you're working in um in a company i mean and most of you guys probably know here uh it's it's quite complicated to to take away two months to travel right i mean so, some companies even taking one month to travel is is quite difficult. Here you have much more control of your life. Like I said, it really depends on your lifestyle. But I mean, it's it's a fun challenge. I would say it's it's riskier, yeah. But the uh, the reward is is higher, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Pedro and Beatriz, just to close the topic and go to to the questions from the audience. What do you think more from a, a company and employer perspective? What do you think about this? What's the the knowledge the experience that you have here? On the company side, I would say that uh, there is still some um, some uh, reticence so to some extent to, to to have people on contracting mode. Uh, it's not there are a lot of companies that are, have this approach of if you work with me, I will give you a contract, uh, which is very noble of them in my opinion. But at the same time, also I'll guess might be eliminating people who choose to, I mean, I don't want a labor contract. I want uh, to, to work with you as a contractor. Um, but I think in those occasions, things eventually uh, are settled. Uh, what's def in the end of the day, what we said, it's exactly risk versus reward, of course. I mean, you earn more. You will feel, and in the tech careers report, we realize this as well. You will perceive that your pay is way fairer because you set the price, right? I mean, <laughs> if you put the price at 200, someone will pay 200. If no one will pay 200, you lower your price. But at the end of the day, you lowered your price. Uh, and maybe this is a sort of negotiation that in salaries and that in labor contracts is not as linear uh, or maybe people b believe and in some cases they do not have a choice other than to accept the the, the, the price that they are given um, then finally uh, I would say that this is changing partly with the remote and the global uh, talent uh, and uh, that companies are going through which were of course contracting plays a different role. I mean, it's easier for a company and for a candidate in a different country to interact and to exchange uh, labor for income uh, in a contracting way than it, through other way. Uh, for you to have a contract with a company that's not based in your country, this company will have to hire an intermediate. Great, uh, but uh, it will add complexity to the model. But the contractor uh, model allows you to 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 work with companies globally. So in that sense, I expect that this will increase as well. Yeah, yeah, because there's no easy way, for example, to someone I don't know from Nigeria to be hired by a company in Germany and to have a regular employee contract because paying mm -hmm. the salaries, where do people pay taxes? So being a contractor, having this kind of company that can basically be paid as if another company 
it was so uh, one mm -hmm. person one company right that is possible uh, internationally and the other way around it's not okay so let's go for the for the honest question so the the, the top question that we have it's what is the general feeling by employers featured on landing jobs to employ people outside the youth zone and sponsor work permits uh, and i i think that we have already talked a bit about this but there's one one part of this question which is regarding bigger companies versus startups so which are the companies that are more prone to accept these kinds of uh, work flu fluxes uh startup scale-ups companies <laughs> i don't know government companies we have What's two your take questions on this? there so one yeah. of them is work per one thing is to relocate someone the other thing is to work with someone internationally and sometimes we actually have companies that are today open to working remotely because afterwards they will want to bring this person to the headquarters uh, if you ask me which kind of companies invests more in relocation and is able to support people in relocating to their headquarters corporates bigger companies of course uh, no not even it's not even a uh, an issue. Government agencies usually, at least in Portugal, you need to be Portuguese or to have a Portuguese uh, uh, NIF, uh, VAT ID, to, to, to be able to work for the government. So that changes things a bit. But in every other company, yes, relocation is very, very common. A startup is more likely to let you stay at your place because the whole, the cost, the value added of the cost of bringing you to the headquarters is still quite low uh, even though we also have the argument for startups that sometimes they 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 try to emphasize which is the culture and uh, so in <clears throat> imagine that you are working for a startup with 15 people and you are the one uh, outside or even uh, that has a core in one place and then a lot of people on the side of course there is a lot to be said on the um, on the where does where will decisions be made and uh, uh how will this impact actually people that are not able to to be there and there is there is already a lot of discussions happening around the uh, hybrid models for example which is if people for example with uh, uh which are more economically disadvantaged if these people are more likely to work from home to avoid the commute because they can't live as close to the city as other people, if these people are more likely to work from home, and if people who work from home are less likely to be promoted, isn't this creating some sort of uh, a vicious cycle? So, of course, we are still starting to see the, the the consequences of what will it mean to have an hybrid workforce or to have remote workforces. That's why some people say that hybrid does not work, because you'll have uh, a workforce in one place and uh, remote people everywhere. And how do you make sure that the same treatment is given to everyone? Yeah. So uh, cutting it short, in, in the beginning of your answer, you said that, OK, corporates will probably work harder for to relocate people. So if you want to go yourself or yourself and your family to, uh, um, to Europe to work in a company, probably the, the corporates will be uh, easier targets for that one. But on the other way, startups and scale are more open to people that want to work from whatever they are. Uh, and it's interesting because you might have people that would rather one or the other format. Uh, there's a lot of people, for example, I don't know, uh, there are a lot of people from Brazil say, okay, I want because of this security and etc. I want to go to Europe and take my family. Usually people which are more experienced, not the younger ones. Um, and in some other case, you have people would rather stay in their own country and work in this at the same time for another region okay so uh, another question um it's the startup scene is known obviously to be chaotic and it may require some more of the employees time flexibility over time stress considering general well-being is dependent on a good work-life balance how do you manage this i can start for this one okay to answer yeah, this one me too i, I have think a lot to say to, it, it, i have a lot really, to say it, about yeah. this one <laughs> yeah so but, <laughs> but gentlemen and, and gentlewoman will be, need to be short on this because our time is almost running out and we still have some questions so yeah. i'll ask it to be should be brief and i'll try to do the same i think that it really depends on the startup and in, in, in skyward because for example in portugal a few years ago i don't know eight years ago being in a startup was very very risky you know, because there was no capital money uh, it was most of the times people went for the challenge and earned low wages 
nowadays things have changed a lot and they have changed in Portugal and in Europe, at least speaking about this geographical context as well. So a startup usually already has money that can pay comparable salaries to other companies. Just to give you a glimpse in that report, that uh, Decker's report, scale-ups are paying more than corporates in average, in average, of course. So we are talking here about companies that sometimes have 50 people, 100 people, 200 people that pay better wages than the, uh, the, the more established corporate companies. Regarding the work flexibility, one thing is sure. Talent retention is one of the most important things nowadays because it's rather common for people to go and work in place and three, four, six months afterwards, they already are leaving. And this is a terrible cost for the company because people have just you know learned the trick and then they go off so keeping people in the company is making companies big and small tend to care a bit more about okay how well people are and treat people a bit better not so much as numbers as we were saying even corporates than they used to do uh, and from my own knowledge i know that there are startups that are very chaotic but there are other startups that are not so much chaotic and sometimes it's more a question of culture than of lack of structure okay uh Rui, if you want to take a bit of yes. this. Yes. So, uh, I mean, th this chaotic, the huge time flexibility, overtime and stress. Yes, it's true. But I will say one thing is that in the startups, they care much, much more about your work-life balance than any corporate that I worked in. And let me say, it was usually for the employees of the corporate to to do some extra hours sometimes and you were looked upon if you were not doing like that in the startup is not like this and people try to incentivize and there's a lot of measures to have this work life balance that being said like i i, I mentioned before in startups sometimes you do lots of stuff you you wear many hats because it's short stuff and you do lots of stuff but you feel the shirt that you wear, you know, and it's it's very different when you work some extra time and you have to do that in startups as much as you have to do in corporate. But you have a feeling of, OK, I'm doing this because this, this is my project and this is what I'm doing, you know, and you you feel the, the badge that you bring on your on your on your shirt and when you're in a in a corporate you do that as well and you're looked uh, sideways if you're not doing that and um, and uh, but it's the same thing and the the work balance i i feel that is much more respected in a startup than in this in a in a corporate okay Cool. So now we have two very interesting questions. I think they're polemic enough to be very interesting. The first one is from Adele Kashia. Uh, I think I, I pronounced it right or not. Uh, it's how should the approach to learning a job or remote job change for candidates over 50 years old? And I'll leave this one for people who have more perspective from the company side. Pedro and Beatriz, please. Can you see the question? Candidates over 50, right? It's yeah, this question. Exactly. Uh, I'll leave it for Beatrice because I know she has answered this question quite uh, often in other in other events. Yeah, I, I do get this question a lot, what it's like to to change um, jobs and even change careers entirely uh, when being um, of an older age than uh, what's normally expected. Um, there is a very controversial uh, topic around recruiters. This is a very controversial topic, although some people agree that um, it's more difficult, however, never impossible. It's more difficult. Um, I believe that it, 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 this is my humble opinion, please don't judge me for it, but uh, I do believe that it's, it's the same, although it will take a lot more um, personal branding. It will take a lot more effort in terms of reviewing your CV, finding out what's really relevant, uh, because these people can have a lot of experience. That's fine. That's more than normal. Um, but be sure that you manage to point out what's really important and everything, and this will help in this type of situations. Um, overall, I think it's more how you present yourself than how old you are. And this is cross ages for me. 
Yeah, that's true. But do you consider that there's still a big prejudice regarding people, older people? So I, I'm five years from 50, so I, I'm reaching the also the, the limit. But I, my personal opinion is that companies, even though they speak a lot about diversity and in, in the end, the result, it's always a bit, you know, a prejudice that comes to things. And passing yeah. this over, it's it's really a strong gap. But the, the funny thing is that most of the times, companies complain about the lack of maturity of people that they hire. So fuck, what's, what's, the, what's the matter here, right? People are yeah. crazy. But yeah, but it's, you know? true. it's still a lot of prejudice. Um, yeah, the, the, but that, 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 sorry, sorry. It's like trying to change that one step at a time, but the reality is it's still there, the prejudice. So it takes a lot more effort than you would normally take if you were a younger person. Yeah. So then we have another question, which is, not the same but also i think very interesting which is what does a tech recruiter thinks when an applier has a lot of experiences in a short amount of time so the grasshopper right <laughs> yeah I, I can i can answer this uh, i guess there is uh, it has to be a balance like i said if you have in a 10 years career span if one person has been always on the same company competing with one that has been in, for instance, three, the one that has been in three, I guarantee you that the, the company will prefer because it has experience. They have uh, lots of different contexts. You know that is someone that can um, adapt, you know, and they will prefer. That being said, imagine if in uh, a 10 year span, a guy has like, imagine, eight different jobs mm. this is not good this is not good because this is someone that isn't loyal to to the company and why did he change it was at the first bit he will leave the project he will leave the team it, it was that he was hired but then after six months the company understood so this guy is full of shit. he doesn't know what he's saying here and he was sent away and this is not good you know, so there is, I, I, I don't know if there is um, a concrete metric on this one, but like around, usually it's around two years or something like that. That's the, the, the point when you, I mean, you, you've done a lot with this company. If you leave now, there is no issue. Sometimes it's, um, is lesser time sometimes is longer it depends really on your position on the projects you you are given uh, but in the end of the day experience is really good if you move between companies it's really good don't exaggerate it and when you move do it with a purpose okay yeah. mm -hmm. i can add a bit to that one as recruiter myself you know uh, i've hired uh, <laughs> the, some dozens of people in in the past in, in terms of tech uh, and what I can say is that if I see a CV that is always six months, six months, six months, that guy would better always have been working as a contractor because that's fairly common. So people go and do one project and a project. If it says a permanent employee, it shows a red flag in my head signing, okay, this guy has a pattern, you know, and this pattern does not fit what I want, which is someone that I know that obviously people turnover and go they change jobs and that that's okay but at the same time i need someone that can have a, a minimum commitment to the position that i have opened for her and one thing is for us for a 12 i don't know imagine one six month one three month one two month period if i see that among uh two two years one year and a half uh experiences i say okay the, the, there was not a fee there was some problem here but that's okay that's one thing a whole cv made of that well, it becomes a bit suspicious, in my opinion, as the recruiter. So if I would receive that CV, I would say, hmm, what is this, right? Uh, because it, it can either be someone that has troubles adapting to the, to the workplace, that is always searching for the next raise, and right, salary raises is, are important, but you need to have some, uh, to prove some kind of stability also to be of value for someone who is hiring you. Uh, or it's someone that is always fired from all the places that <laughs> he has landed. Right. So again, one thing is if people uh, work as contractors mostly, that's fairly common. But in the other way around, I would say that that interval to change jobs that I mentioned before, the 1.5 years and 2.3 years, that would be more or less a sweet spot. Having two long periods, as we said, it's also suspicious because you think, okay, this guy is 
does not know anything else. But again, but it depends on the find, position, right? It depends on the position. Of course, if you if you evolve inside the company, sometimes exactly. it's a good thing. Yeah, exactly. And but sometimes people don't put that on their CVs. They just say, okay, I've been in this company for 10 years. They yeah. don't mention that, okay, they entered as an That's a fatal mistake. And then yeah. a developer, mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then project manager, team leader, whatever. Exactly. And that's very relevant to also having the CVs mm -hmm. when you spend a lot of time inside the company and you do some different roles along the way. That's completely different. Just 10 years in the same spot as developer, a Java developer. Yeah, yeah. okay. If I if I may add from a perspective of different companies, I don't believe it says linear as one may think. Um, I have recruited, I mean, sourced for a lot of companies that it's like, okay, if a guy in the past six years has worked for more than three companies, is a no go for us. We won't even interview him. So big red flag for them. I have others where. Um, well, they're, they're just like, if the person has had relevant experience, we don't really care how many time he has spent there because we don't really know why he left. So sometimes it's a matter of speaking with a person, understanding the move before we judge um, a book by its cover. So there's still a lot of prejudice around this as well. I don't particularly agree with it, um, but uh, I understand the company side as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're reaching the end of this event. I'll just go. We have three last questions. One, I think that Pedro Cash already answered in the, in the poll. What is the job market like for junior DevOps engineer in Portugal? Well, uh, I think that DevOps is something that's clearly on the rise, both in terms of demand and salary. So I would strongly advise that as one of possible specialization for whoever is in the market. Then Rena asked about the possibility to acquire job permission or to get the NIF remotely and get ready to work before being approached for the for a job. I'm not completely sure about this. I don't know if Bea or Pedro, do you know about this specific specificity of this process? Getting a fiscal number before getting a job, but uh, I will do something. Uh, so you need to do that physically. You cannot do it virtually. Remotely. You cannot do it remotely. You, at least you must have a legal guardian, so to speak, to do it physically in a, a, the finance uh, branch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll I, I leave my contact there. And then if you have you or anyone else any kind of question, please get it back to, to, to us and we'll try to answer you as soon as possible. The last question that I have here, trying to fill everything, is is landing jobs able to find work for coding bootcamp graduates? Well, I, I'll answer one part and I'll ask Pedro and Beatrice. We hire bootcamp graduates ourselves. Okay. <laughs> so that's the first thing. And a lot of very good, very good persons. And that's the, the, the bootcamp movement. It's gaining representativity in the, in the channels to access the market. But Pedro and Beatriz, regarding the job offers that we have, the positions, uh, are people looking for bootcamp graduates? Uh, just in the same way that they are open to remote, they are also opening up to bootcamp. I would say that the biggest uh, um obstacle here is usually hiring managers and whenever we have a, a like usually recruiters they can like sometimes pass them but then i think it's uh i don't know uh, we have Louis who is a developer so he can help us understand but uh, developers usually and hiring managers and senior and team leads they usually have uh, their their thoughts about uh, bootcamp graduates when to hire them and when not to uh, hire them. So sometimes it's a bit tricky to convince companies to open the the the, the pool. Of course, in our case, we always want. I mean, if this person can do the job, uh, have them. But I would say there is still some prejudice here, mostly on the um, prejudice, some ideas and some reservations mostly on the, the hiring and engineering side. So the HRs, uh, as long as the engineer, then the HRs do not send more uh, people with boot camps because they know that they are going to, to, to come back uh, to them. And it depends on the seniority of the role, you know, because mm -hmm. if, if it's an entry level, uh, most of the times uh, companies are open to boot camp uh, developers. And uh, imagine if, it only matters if it is your first job, right? Because after after that, like in your third job or something like that, people don't don't care about your uh, 
your education. They care about your experience. What have you done at what company? What was your role? So this is important, the bootcamp or not bootcamp, for an entry level. And uh, many, many companies are start to um, adapting to bootcamp. The, the, the issue with bootcamps is that they are very focused, you know, uh, as opposing, for instance, in a five years university degree or something like that. Bootcamps usually are very short and very focused in one task. And I would say that for starters, it's great. Imagine a bootcamp that is focused on Rails or Ruby on, Rail, uh, Ruby on Rails. If you go to a position that is uh, a Rails developer or something like that, I mean, go for it. It's, it's a great way to enter because uh, they need a, a junior guy that works on Rails and people from the bootcamp are very good at it. It's, it's a bit more trickier when the, the position is more broad and you have to work with lots of stuff at the same time. But that thing is gained with experience. So mm -hmm. maybe you go to some, um, maybe the question came from someone that came from a, a bootcamp, I, I suppose. I would say, imagine in your bootcamp, you focus on, let's say, Python. Try to focus on jobs for Python and develop your career from there. Okay, start in something that you're really good at it, excel in the, um, in the um, technical questions, technical interviews from, uh, from recruitment, go there and prove that you are an interested guy in what's going around, that you are eager to learn, that you are really good at what you do specifically. And after that, I mean, the sky's the limit. Once you are in the market, you can spread your wings and fly. And it doesn't matter if you come from a boot camp or the highest uh, level university. Yeah. And prepare yourselves, get your LinkedIn updated, your CV updated. If you mm -hmm. can, get a GitHub repository. So everything counts, you know. And don't be shy. If you see some company that you want to work with, don't go necessarily by the job application. Find the person who is directly the director or team leader or whatever. Find the email, send him directly your CV if needed, if if it's possible. You know, it's really you know it mostly depends on each one of you, of course, to build and to own your own career. That's that's a very strong message. We, for example, at Learning Jobs, we try to help, but we can help everyone. Cannot help in any way. It's mostly something that you need to to own. It's yours, you know, and it's very important. Well, we need to close. We are over time already. Thank you, everyone, for attending. You know, we'll be sending a feedback email after the, the event with the link for the recording. If you want to share this with any other person that you want to, to review some part, you have the, the recording. Uh, and you got you get have the email that we got your back at learning.jobs. Anything we can be of help, please don't be shy. Contact us. We'll try to make our best to help you in any way possible. Okay. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Big abraço. Grande abraço em português. Thank you, guys. Bye. <laughs>